Oops. What happened here? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the, my first effort at doing a virtual eye cut versus hands-on stuff. So um, I took the liberty to rename this aircraft to be ours here at Vancouver. And I would remind you that those of you that may or may not have completed the online uh, course in Axis, please do so. And if you have not completed it uh, by uh, when we start this, if you've not completed it, please do so and then just give me a quick email uh, to say you've completed it and I can go in there and look up your ID number and uh, sign stuff off like a good little trainer. Um, keep in mind, oh, shoot. Oh, I see the problem. All right, now it should be full screen. Um, keep in mind some of the some of the slides that I have here today do have for official use only. So be a little bit cautious of um, what you say or do later on. Um, OPSEC, everybody's gone through that part of it. It's really remembering that security and confidentiality is to uh, prevent uh, disclosure of missions and activities that we don't want people to know about or to be able to um, figure it out and then join us. And uh, we don't need that kind of stuff. Some of the stuff to always remember is, is your personal, uh, personally identifiable, identifiable information, your mission status, any ID, name or rank, um, definitely not over a radio. Uh, Com information, you don't locate your frequencies or specific Oh, shoot. Um, specific locations to the facility. Remember official phone numbers, they stay in the incident command or your mission base and uh, agents, other agencies that may be participating. If, if you're working with a county, uh, FEMA, uh, whoever for a search and rescue or just simply a uh, exercise. Code words we don't use. We use plain language as best as possible. The P25 section is, all that really means is that we go from an analog or a nice little sine wave. For those of you that have watched ocean waves, that's pretty close to one. And digital just means you square that off and it makes it a lot clearer. It is not an encryption mode. And encryption we only use when it's requested by an external customer. For safety, especially for radios, you need to be really conscious of the environment that you're in before you set up any antenna. Look for power poles, look for transformers hiding on a power pole. Well, they don't really hide, but they're pretty visible. Um, and stay, stay away from that. Stay away from metal buildings um, or the edges of metal buildings if you can isolate your antenna. The other one is uh, tripping hazards. Um, you can have it either way over here on the, the grass side. Um, a lot of times these come into the building and uh, the best way to do it is cover it with a mat or tape it down, do anything to keep people from getting hurt. When it comes to antennas themselves, put some tape around those guy wires, just something that flutters to keep people to say, whoops, I don't wanna cut my head off or get myself hurt and tangled up into it. And if you notice, there's guy wires on this antenna, but you can't see them. And that's the whole function of keeping in mind that you need to even flag your um, guy wires. Ensure your grounding on your radios. Um, thunderstorms have a wonderful capability of wiping out a radio and an antenna. So um, be very conscientious of your environment when you're setting everything up and if you have to, you disconnect everything if you hear thunderstorms. And being a weather guy for many years, um, it happens all the time. Grounding goes without saying. Fuses always have some spare fuses available for you wherever you go. Um, know where the main power switch is. This caveat, the always remove primary power before servicing. 
we needn't worry about that too much because any servicing is done by our national headquarters maintenance people. Um, lightning arresters and grounding switches are nice to have as well. And the lightning arresters usually are associated with your coax cable. Um, this is one of those for official use only. These are the repeaters we have. To my knowledge right now, um, R21 was, uh, had a lightning strike and to my knowledge, it's still under repair. The items in the little red box are what we're going to use as a comm unit leader would indicate what that particular exercise or mission is needs. That first, uh, where'd it go? That first, like, like in Olympia, R25, 30 is for the radio um, channel in the airport, in the aircraft. That for us on the, on the surface is zone two, channel three. We also have, um, because I run a Southwest net here to be able to include Oregon stations. Oh, what happened? To include Oregon stations, we use either R44 or R37 to either communicate to Oregon for information that they cannot obtain or in reverse for us. Um, all these radios are clear line of sight. That's why there's so many of them. You might be able to, Yakima might be able to talk to Tri-Cities, but I guarantee you through all that mountain, you're not gonna hear anybody on the west side of the Cascade Range. This is Wama, should we have been there? This is a really nice, clean looking comm station. Um, I was there about this time last year and uh, we went through the whole sequence of events to make sure everything was functional. They do have a spare radio. They do have a spare power supply. Here is the primary VHF radio that they're using. These two radios are for um, on FAA frequencies and that's to allow us to be able to use them out on the ramp or keep track of uh, airborne aircraft um, when we're using uh, that uh, airport for uh, glider and flight training and um, uh, some of our first uh, efforts at uh, getting a cadet airborne. Zulu and um, local time clocks. This is our long distance radio. And down here we have our intra-service radios that we would use for various folks out on the ramp for safety functions or just to communicate to the base. And then of course you've got your landlines. Today, these are what we're gonna cover. And this is what I normally do, but the 5112, which is the handheld equivalent to the radio that we're talking about, <clears throat> I do not have. Um, so I will focus on the 5317. And I, I also added a couple slides for the inter-service radio to give people a quick look at it because you can't see very much on this little radio. But these are the three, um, types that we most commonly use in all the squadrons. This one's good for about a quarter mile, especially if you got fresh batteries and uh, you can see the guy down at the end of the end of the field. It probably works very effectively. Um, we used to use these in Idaho uh, with our ground team. We'd have the ground team lead. He'd have this radio and our our search members would have the little ISRs. If they're on the far end of the line, they would call in or they'd make a whistle um, to stop the line. And then they would communicate what they had to whoever the ground team lead was. And then that ground team leader in turn, if there was a distance away from the van, they would communicate with the person in the van or they could communicate with an aircraft that was airborne, perhaps um, hybrid, who is making a big circle so that they can make sure uh, they can communicate back to mission base. The little ISR, pretty much uh, well-contained little unit. The antenna actually folds when it's not in use. Um, be sure to make sure it's in the vertical position um, before you uh, uh, communicate because it gives you the best range and make sure you hold it um, horizontally or uh, vertically so that an antenna is up before you push the button. Just a, a quick view of the screen here. I, I just put in channel seven. Uh, we commonly use that here in Washington 80. Um, 
the key lock, the reason I highlight that is because a lot of times you'll turn on the radio and, and you won't be able to get anything. You say um, mission base, this is whoever, and nothing happens. And that's because that locks in place. Just turn the radio off, wait a second or so, push the on button and hold it. And when the screen opens up, that key will go away and then you can either receive information or transmit information. Our various power supplies, this one's rather light. It's used on those um, long range uh, radios. Battery power, like what's in the van, or today I'm using a small 12 volt battery uh, to run the radio here for when I'm giving you the display later on. And this great big heavy monster um, weighs about 35 pounds and you will get nice muscle tone carrying that around for a while. There is a smaller battery or a smaller power supply that fits right under our uh, radio and it comes in a special little casing and it's very convenient for mission bases or when you're deploying somewhere and you have to set up. And I don't have a picture of that. Here's standard coaxial cable. This is the standard connection that you'll find probably on every piece of equipment you have in your home that's mobile. Uh, this one's primarily for plugging into your power supplies. This is our 5317 radio, just in a kind of a graphic display. It has a power supply, the antenna, and accessory pigtail. These are the three primary um, feeds you'll find off the back of the radio. The other thing that's of any importance here is I kind of highlighted, and I'll try to show that later on, the small screw on the top of the microphone um, where you plug it in is uh, has an importance. So uh, it tells you how you've aligned it to correctly um, connect it. And then on the back of it, we do not have this optional remote control. We just have these three functions. And if you're in the van and you've been whatever transmitting and didn't have power on, you turn the van off and try to turn it on and it dies, for absolute certainty, make sure you disconnect your DC power and disconnect this accessory connector. Then you can jumpstart the, the, the van. Otherwise you might get a power surge and damage the radio. Um, here's the front of the radio and in a much better um, view. These buttons here, I just picked out of a generic um, manual. The only one that makes any sense of all those five is the scan function, which we use. This button is an LED. It's just a little tiny light. When you push to talk and transmit, it turns red. When you release the push to talk on the microphone, it turns green. It's really a significant, uh, it signifies that the repeater has heard you and you can assume that your message is sent and someone's going to respond back to you. Your on off switch, it's also a volume control. You turn it up just like normal volume on a radio. And the zone switch, um, you can you push that uh, to change from zone to channel, and then you can rotate it to get to the various channel or the various zone, depending on what you're doing. These are the five buttons that we have on our radios here in Washington. The transmit power. Um, is in a little blocked area so that you don't accidentally hit it. You have to push it. The screen will show either high power or low power. The best choice or the best option is always to do and transmit on the lowest power possible so that you don't um, uh, overpower. Come on. So you don't overpower um, some other station nearby. Scan function, you simply push it on. And if the channels that you have selected uh, are in the radio, it will start rotating through them. The, the, the best advice that I have is try to limit the amount of stations you put in any scan, because the more you have, the more difficult it is to be able to find out who called you and when, um, because you don't get much time when it shows up on that screen to be able to stop scan, change to the zone or channel uh, possible uh, to talk to that person. Um, and to 
turn off the scan, you just push the button. Scan Ed, this is where you start to um, be able to program the radio for specific um, zones and channels for an exercise function or for a mission. Um, once, you, once you push the scan ed, then you have to hit the select switch to activate what you want to save. Then you rotate the knob just like a normal volume switch until you find the zone or channel that you're working on. And then you, you push it again and it activates that, that uh, zone and channel as part of the scan. Select squelch. You can push it, but I guarantee you, you won't hear anything because it kills all noise and it includes, for me anyway, 90% or 95% of the time you can't hear anybody. So I would just recommend that you just don't use select squelch. Just push the button and it turns it off. And then you should be able to hear just about anybody um, in the area that you're working. This is the clear secure button. It only works one way. You push the button, it says secure. You push the button, it says clear. We stay in clear. If it's insecure, you're gonna see this little icon at the top of that little window. And you only do that if some outside activity has asked you to go secure. Key select, uh, that has various encryption, multiple encryption keys in it. The, the best thing I use it for is to just turn it off so I can get back to the zone and channel that I'm working on. This is out of the manual. It just shows generally what the screen looks like. Here's your zone, here's your channel, and up above will be the zone select indicators. And I've just highlighted both of them at the moment. When the window comes up and it's going through its normal um, sanity check and it does its internal um, checks to make sure everything's functioning. When it comes up online, it'll default to wherever you were originally uh, from the last time you turned it on. This monitor value uh, little icon will always be there. It turns off when you hit the push to talk. And the minute you release the push to talk button, the little monitor comes back on. I have not had a need to use the phone and I don't see it um, here at uh, Vancouver. When I'm in scan mode, the little triangle comes up. The encryption key, like I said, you have to push that clear secure button in order for that to display. Here's an example of um, R21 as a repeater. It's in, it's in its digital function. This is the name for the, the repeater site, which is, uh, we, we acronym is BAFA. It's actually a peak over to the west side, uh, northwest of Vancouver. It's on zone 23 and it's in channel one. These two icons, if this icon is displayed, first you're running scan and second, the, the one on the right then will be rotating. Here's another one, R44. This is a council crest. This is an Oregon repeater. Um, the one that uh, I use commonly on Thursday evenings for the net, it's zone 20, channel one. And when I'm scanning it, that rotates. So, class, the bar above the zone and the channel, can you view them together? And anyone can answer that. Feel free to unmute and speak out. No, you can only have one of them at a time, I believe. Absolutely correct. And why? It's because if the bar is above the zone, you're changing only the zone. If it's over the channel, you're changing the channel. And the only way you can do that is to move it by hitting, pushing into that select switch button. Um, what task is, oh shoot. Anyway, I answered the question for everybody. You push the select switch. That's how you move from zone to channel. If the encryption icon is on, does the channel name end in a P? Um, anybody? Well, maybe I should ask, does it have to end in a P?
pregnant pause? No. No. The, encrypt the encryption is only used if another agency makes a request. Then that's when you push that clear secure button. When in scan, does what does the static right symbol display indicate? That's the, well, anyway. Be rotating. There you go. That tells you that you're in scan and it says it's rotating. And it's a reminder that you are in scan as well. On the, on the handheld EFJ5112, that icon doesn't rotate. It just shows as this funny looking arrow, zigzag arrow. Dang it. Well, we went through this. The multifunction indicator, that's that little, little LET on the top. And what it does is if it's glowing red, you're transmitting. If it's green, the repeater is connected and you know that you've been reasonably successful getting your message out. And you're just waiting for someone to answer back. In scan, how do you turn it off? Just push the button again. There you go, absolutely correct. Also, when in scan and someone calls you, you only have about two, maybe three seconds at most to look at that little screen to see who it was. Um, if you're really fast, you might be able to push, push to talk and it'll hold it, but I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Just simply turn scan off, select the channel and zone that you need to talk to that person communicating with you. Quick question. Yes, ma'am. On that encryption, that could be on any of our channels? Yes. Um, if it doesn't matter who it is, if uh, say FEMA or I don't know who else, um, uh, say WASDOT maybe, Washington State Department of Transportation or FEMA, and we're doing a unified type of command and they have something very specific they wish to do. They say, I'm on this zone and this channel or they're in their reserved zone and channel and they say, please go encrypted. That's when you would move to that zone and channel that they specify and go encrypted. Pro words, we use these an awful lot. I've just highlighted a few of them because I can, I can make the background go yellow and it looks pretty. Um, but primarily, if you get on a, on a net, you're gonna see people use these almost um, exclusively. Uh, Wilco is just short for like, we'll comply. Um, we use that on the national net at um, six in the morning. I go to the noon one, and then there's another one at six, I think six in the evening. And Wilco means someone has asked you to do something. You're just saying, okay, I'm going to comply. And generally, you're assuming net control. Uh, that just it just means that you're in charge for that moment, and then you can return it once you've completed whatever has been asked of you. Um, you'll you'll hear radio check a lot of times. And if I if I get really lucky with the Beaver Fox station, and they haven't left to Eugene yet. We'll try that later on. Uh, over just means that I've given you the information I want. Do you need anything else? If you get out, it means you're done. There, you don't need to communicate anymore. You passed on that information and off you go. And you've opened up the frequency for someone else to talk. Now, the CAT Form 110, this is your standard comm log. Um, for people that like myself, when I'm doing uh, working on a mission, we will have a mission number. This one just happens to be a group level exercise. So we're using more than just one squadron in the Washington wing, or we're working with uh, Oregon and Washington in conjunction. It doesn't really matter. Your functional, your call sign for that particular mission base is gonna be called Era 50. In this case, we were up at uh, Pearson Field in Vancouver, but we've, go away. We've worked up at uh, Kelso um, and worked with uh, the Cowlitz County folks and we've done joint search and rescue exercises. So it all, it all functions out. What is really important is if it's not written, it did not happen. And it's very important because if you're looking for um, information that might have occurred several hours before and say, how come we didn't get a hold of whatever ground team at a specific time, if you don't have it on there, they never contact it. Well, now the next question is, if they haven't contacted, why didn't you initiate a call to get a hold of them? So 
it works both ways, folks. And uh, the log is extremely important to make life easier because it does get really busy at times. What you do is your whoever's your comm unit leader, they'll work with in conjunction with your ops folks and find out what frequencies are going to be necessary for that particular day and that particular exercise. And you can end up and make an, make like a like a shortcut for yourself. Here's TAC one, here's R44, here's Cap Guard, and here's the intra-service radio. And those then you can just highlight as A, B, C, or D, depending on who you're calling. And then you just list that in your channel reference. It makes it a lot quicker than saying, oh, I'm in 20-1. You know, by that time, the guy's already passed on half a dozen words of information that you needed to copy down. So it is important that you do this. Um, because I run a net, uh, I think the reg calls for six months. Well, I've been doing it for a couple of years and <laughs> I've got them all. I just don't want to lose anything. I guess I'm a little over ambitious. But remember, the most important thing when you're working in a comm room for a mission or for an exercise, write it down. And if, if you can't get to the comm form, if you only have one comm log, uh, which probably is not really bright, but if you only have one comm log, then write it down on a piece of paper, have a notepad or something, and then enter it later. Um, generally, I like the comm log for each radio that I have in that comm room. Uh, microphones, they do connect, and I'll have to show that to you here in a little bit. Um, how you do that, You, if it's connected, you pull that outer ring uh, on the little cable connection and it releases it from the, the radio. And then to push it, that's where that little small screw is important because that lines with the top. You push it until you hear a click. Um, for speaking into the microphone, one to three inches is usually good enough to kill any background noise um, uh, in the surrounding area. And you can speak clearly to whoever the receiver is. Uh, old Phil here, he's uh, working awful hard today, trying to make sure that everything's correct. And this is the area that I was talking about on that outer ring. And I'll have to show that to you later on. I think we're just about ready to go into the other side. Um, a quick overview of the MICOM 2. This is the most common radio that many squadrons have. A few of them have the ones with all the little push buttons. That's for this uh, automatic link establishment and allows you to talk to every region within continental United States, including our national headquarters folks. On those radios, uh, on that particular radio, there's someone listening 24 hours a day. Um, this is the MICOM 2, which is, like I said, is the most, most common. Uh, you're going to see, um, normally, I just see the channel up here. Um, and then, cat, excuse me, I've got an intermission. Thank you. <sighs> Sorry about that delay. Um, the on-off switch is purely just like a radio. You just turn it and raise the volume. These keys allow you to push for every time you push it, it moves this little channel from 60, in this case, 67 to 68. The function key has uh, the ability, it, it, knows, it shows you your channel, but it'll also show you um, the frequency, which then becomes for official use only and generally I just tell people it's there. Your squelch mode does exactly the same thing as the other radio does and it will kill all receipt of any for anything. Lower sideband, it's just, it's a term used that we're only using half of a specific frequency on a specific type of carrier wave. And I know that's Greek to a lot of folks, uh, those that are ham operators get that right away. Scan function, I've not been able to use it, so I'm not gonna talk about it. The call function and the monitor function, they are both um, programmed into these radios by our wing uh, commander of comm. And what the monitor function does, it runs through 
all the channels Pacific Coast region. And then if you want to call somebody, you push the call button and whatever's programmed in there will call until they find. If there's, if nothing happens, uh, sorry, if nothing happens, um, the radio comes back and beeps at you and says no link. But your radios, there may be a tape, a label on them that says sale call, that's select calling. And uh, that our radios do have that capability. So, uh, did I skip something? No, the function key does what? And I, I just briefly covered that. So it displays the channel number by default. There's a there's a item called clarifier, which is supposed to clear up any drift in the frequency. The next one shows the specific frequency that was programmed into it. And noise blanker, if if that little NB shows up in this screen. Fox one zero, we were Fox uh, four. Radio check over. Excuse my interruption. We'll just turn that down for a moment. Um, the last thing I have to show on this one is the primary button. They should all be defaulted to channel 85. And so if you push that, 85 shows up here. Um, and then you can push the up button or the down button to whatever channel you want to do. Um, for Washington uh, wing itself, when we uh, do our net call on the evenings of Thursday night, um, if you hit 85, if you hit that primary button from wherever you were, it'll default to 85. And we use channels 8384. And just recently, because of bad atmosphere, we go to channel 95. And so it's just a simple matter of pushing those buttons up and down until you get there. So that's what all this does. But if you see NB, go in there and push the, once that shows, the function key, you just keep pushing the button and, and channel number shows, uh, clarifier shows up, then frequency, then noise blanker. And if you see noise blanker, just push the button and it'll turn that off. Squelch, again, it limits the noise that you hear, the background noise, um, and only allows the strongest signals to come in. Um, trust me, this is another one of those issues where squelch does a very good job and uh, it'll kill just about everything. Lower sideband just enables and disables that operation. It's just pushing it on, moves it. Scan, turns it on or off. The call button, like I was mentioned earlier, if you don't get anybody to connect with you, you'll get this beep and a no link shows up. And then you just hit your push to talk switch on your microphone and it turns it off. Monitor scans the Pacific Coast regions 83 to 92. Those are the channels reserved for the Pacific Coast region. When monitor is working, all you're going to hear, when you push that monitor button, all you're going to hear is just, a, it's like a little hiss. You don't see that, you don't hear the normal radio noise. And priority just means you default to channel 85. Um, and it's convenient because it's right in the middle of or close to the middle of these 83 to 92. And that's the whole purpose of it being there. Then just press the up and down triangular buttons to change the channel that you want. This is the back of that particular radio. Um, just shows what the accessory connections are. We just primarily have power supply output for our, our uh, antenna and a ground. And that's part of it. I'm, what I'm gonna do now is kill this where it is. I'm going to stop share because I got to rearrange my little my little desk here. <clears throat> this is R5317. This is the battery I'm working on right now. And I hope that it's clear enough that you can all see this. I'm on as I tilt over and look stupid. I'm on uh, zone 20, channel one. Now, if I push scan, will I see any of those icons? Major, 
if you could tilt it just a tiny bit more, there's a, they're perfect. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. If I push scan, I'm going to see that little button rotating, showing that it's in scan mode. The hang up is you don't see the one on the left. That means nothing in zone 20 channel, all the channels in zone 20 are not on scan. So if I stop scan and I move the zone Yeah, R4. If I move it to 21, zone one, now you're going to see a P, which means that's in the digital function. These are all programmed the same in all our radios here in Washington. So it's not that you're going to get confused. There's a listing on the comm side of the house for those of you involved in comm for your individual squadrons, so you know what all of those channels will do. But if I turn this back, If I turn that back to, to R44, I can now contact a station. Caldera, Caldera, this is Caldera 40 on Romeo 44, requesting radio check with Beaver Fox 74, over. Nothing heard. Radio check any station over. Caldera 40, this is Caldera 46. Caldera 46, Caldera 40, I read you clear readable as well. This is Caldera 40 out. And we can thank Colonel Wiggs for that radio check. Um, but that's essentially what happens. Now I'm gonna, if I can see. Oh, crap. Well, I just turned it off, but I'll turn it back on here in a minute. It goes through its normal self test cycle. And when it finishes it, the light, it all illuminates. But your scan function is the one that you will use when you're a lot of times when you're at mission bases or at home. It's just simply a push on, push off. And then if you're in, say, someone asks you to do scan select, you push that button and then you'll see that little, I hope, you'll see that little triangular show up, up in this upper corner. And um, that allows you to rotate through. You can push it on. Say you want that particular channel. If you push on, you're going to see that little icon show up, I hope. And if I push it again, it turns it off. So that's how you can add or delete um, channels within your scan. And to turn it off, I just hit this key select and it goes back to normal. Now, the last thing I'd like to do is to show you how to, when you're transporting this, it's awkward to have the microphone connected. And I know I worked earlier. I don't know if anybody can see it, but there's a, just a little tiny screw right at the top. And all you need to do is just line that up on the top. It sets it up and you hear the click and you're in there. So that's essentially um, how the radio functions how uh, you can just, you change your zone and channel just by clicking them back and forth and you'll see the little bar move back and forth. And that should uh, end this part of the visual. And if folks need a break, uh, on off, turn it off. Now share screen, where that go?
Um, are there any questions up to now on this segment? Because the next one we're going through is uh, the evaluation portion where everybody gets to practice writing, a, uh, uh, copying down a message. If you don't need anything, we'll just progress through so that in the interest of time, um, we don't mess up with the next class. <clears throat> Messages, there's all sorts of types, but the one that we use is the CAT Form 105. <clears throat> it has three parts, it has a header, a body, and what distribution is, um, where it's going, who's received it, who got it first. Um, that's what the distribution does. On the header, the precedence, most of the times that we'll have messages are in the routine. There's a other higher precedence, and I'll get to that in a, in a short time. Your date time group obviously is day, hour, and normally the hour will be in Zulu, and then the month and year that the message was created, who it's from, who it's going to, what the subject is, and the group count, which is important, will just be a number. Um, generally, uh, messages that I've I've practiced on over the number of years is usually less than 20 because greater than 20 num uh, greater than 20 words, um, it gets very difficult to um, make sure everybody receives it. Then there's a, it's called break. And then the, whoever's sending the message always ask, would you like a repeat on the header so that you have got everything clear in your mind. Once that's clear, then the body of the message begins and the person will, will say it either, um, this is one or two sentences. Um, first sentence will be slow. This, all sentences will initially be sent slowly and then followed by normal voice. Then an additional break and they ask the same question, does anybody need um, a repeat on the, some part of the message, a portion of it or all of it? And then finally, when that message is finished and everybody's received it, they'll indicate who, who got it and when. And an example of, uh, what did I do? I skipped it. Well, before we go there, I'll just say, here's the other form of precedence. Your flash override is something the military has used for years. It breaks in at once. You do not do anything. You just make sure that they have it because someone is in uh, really needs some help. Immediate, you can break in, but it's best to let the person just transmit it. Priority is the same for immediate and it overrides things like long routine messages, which like I said, is generally over 20 words and routine messages are normally everyday stuff. Then here's a completed form and here's your, your uh, precedence. This is a, a newer form done here last year. So whatever form you have, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna have a precedence and a time. This one happens to group it all together now. And they have a little down arrow so that you can change your precedence uh, type in a hurry. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're in routine. This one, this one happens to come from Caldera, which is the Washington wing, and our deputy commander for communications, which is Colonel Sinclair. And it goes to all units. The group count is 20. Then a person asks for a break. And then you can say, I didn't get the precedence. I didn't get the date, time, whatever. And then, <clears throat> then there'll be a break and then the message follows. And what I normally do is say, I, I generally say this is in one sentence beginning and then I'll repeat it the second time in normal voice. And I'll just say, for example, while doing your inventory, and it allows people to be able to either make a short abbreviation or give them time to copy it down because I can't write very fast and <clears throat> that's why I kind of go slow. And then the second time I will read it in normal voice while doing your inventory, if you find something missing, blah, blah. I received this from Colonel Sinclair on the 29th of December, and I just sent it to Colonel Wiggs on the 9th of January, 
of this year. Um, this is purely an example of uh, how it's set up and how you can doctor how you can um, document who got what so that if if the chain is broken and the message gets scrambled you can go back up channel until you find the person that has the complete message that's the whole purpose of trying to do this it's a tracking device um, now if you have your cat form 105 we can try copying a message and then what i'd like to do um, if it's at all possible um, once we finish it and i get nobody uh, everybody appears to have received everything then just show it up on your screen and i can take a look at it um, it's probably it's the function of this virtual stuff which makes it kind of difficult so um, if you have your forms ready, um, let me know either by, by some way, just say, yep, I've got it or whatever, and we'll try copying down a message. I'm good to go. Okay. Right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that for just about everybody. And uh, the message precedence will be routine. The date time group will be three, zero, one, seven, four, zero, Zulu. December 20. And you can abbreviate that DEC. Uh, no one will ever criticize you for that. From I spell Whiskey, Alpha, Whiskey, Golf, Slash, or Slant Bar, Delta, Charlie. Two, All Communicators. Subject is SAR X, and I, it can either be, most of you know what SAR X is, or I could, I could have stated, I spell Sierra Alpha Romeo Echo X-Ray. Uh, it's just two ways of, of giving you the subject line. Group count seven. Break, does anyone need a copy on the header? Over. I'd like to have the daytime group again, please. Roger, it's, uh, I'll just do it in normal, what we would normally accept that daytime group is 30 at 1740 Zulu, December 20. Anyone else need a copy? No, body of message follows. It's one sentence. I will do the normal stutter, uh, stuttered type of transmission and then do it in normal voice. First sentence, practice ensures an accurate relay of information. In normal voice, practice ensures an accurate relay of information. Break. Does anyone need a copy on that on the mess on the body of the message? Over. Okay. And I show this message sent to the Wama ICOT students on 9 January at 2052 Zulu. 
And then what you what you would do as the student, you're going to write down that the the day is the ninth, the hour is 2052, and it's Jan 21. And then the optional thing is you can put your initials in there that you were the person that was sitting on the radio at that particular location um, taking the message. And that's essentially the end of the, that part of the practice. Um, you can, if you can, I don't know how it works, but if you can, just show them up to your screen and, and oh yeah, Colonel Maxwell, you have such neat handwriting. I just, just disgusting. <laughs> and uh, I'll take that as a compliment. Oh yeah, you're more than welcome. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Major Griffin, I don't have a camera. Can I just uh, send you a picture on email? Uh, yeah, no, no worries. You can do that. That's easy enough. Um, cadets, do you have? Uh, can you show yours, please? Uh, well, uh, Lieutenant Jeff, yours disappears with your background. I just, it just goes away. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sir, I did mine online. Okay, well that's fine. You can you can send it that way too if you like. Um, just copy it and then, uh, then stick it in an email and send it to. Oh, that's really nice and clear. Well done. All right. It looks like everybody's done a really good job. So moving along now. Uh, let's see. Get back to this. Now the next thing that you need to keep aware of when you're running a radio are the emergency signals. Mayday obviously is an international distress signal. It's repeated three times and it's the equivalent to a flash traffic message. And it means somebody is sinking, the plane is not going to stay airborne, the boat is uh, on the way to the bottom of the ocean, whatever. It's these people want help right now. So that's when you don't mess with it. You just let them, let them say whatever they need to say. And then the stations that are hearing them will try their best to contact stations to get someone to help them. Dang it. The second one, uh, the second two are of lower categories. And it's back in the days when the primary lang international language is in French. So that it's pan pan, what I see is pronounced pon pon. It's done three times. It's the same as an immediate message. They're they're having problems with whatever the ship or the airplane is, and they're trying their best to solve it. And they just want to alert people that hey, if I need help, um, who do I have available that I they can help me um, figure out the problem and save life and whatever. Securite, again, it's done three times. That's when weather geeks like me pass on a warning of some kind that uh, says, you know, it might not be good to fly through that thunderstorm because it goes to 65,000 feet. Can you please contact FAA and divert yourself about 40 miles to the south, north, whatever, to get around it? Um, that's essentially what that Securite type of, just, just as a weather example, does it could be any any navigation or uh, safety safety of navigation issue? It could be um, say with the fires we had last summer. It could be um, FAA telling a pilot to divert out of that area because now that's a restricted area. They don't want anybody in there except the um, the uh, fire bombers. So it's just a way of passing messages across. And it has a it carries a priority uh, precedent, so it's pretty strong. And uh, prohibiting uh, prohibited operating practices. I'm sure glad this is being recorded because it's got to be bad. But prohibited uh, operating practices. There's generally ten of them. Uh, can any of you students give me a few of the ten? Arguing over the radio. Well, that would work. <laughs> Playing music over the radio. Yeah. 
Okay. Why? Oh, there it goes. All uh, right. <clears throat> generally, these are the 10. Um, you don't want to identify anyone by name and rank. That's why we always go by call signs because it's kind of um, free from individual identification unless you have a specific list sitting in front of you that says who the name of the person that owns that call sign. Um, personal conversations, nope, that's not a good deal. Oh, come on. Names and nicknames are a tendency to try to um, hide a lot of times when I was in the service, people would try to do that to hide some mission. Well, that doesn't go long because eventually people will figure it out. Um, not a good thing. Excessive tuning and testing. A lot of people have automatic tuners, which you'll hear maybe a couple clicks and that's fine. If it's a manual tuner, they'll try to turn something on that lasts a, a length of time. It's just kind of rude. Uh, to do that because people are expecting something to happen. Swear words, yeah, that's that's really not a good thing. Um, too much transmitter power, like I mentioned much much earlier. Try to use the lowest power output of, as possible from your radio. And interrupting scheduled in progress activity, nope, not good. Um, <clears throat> practical call signs, they can be used in encampments. Search and rescue, disaster relief, um, some examples. It just identifies a specific area or communication facility. These are our reserved for mission-based activity. These call signs are reserved for activity bases, kind of like Cascade Falcon 25. Um, functional call signs, mission base, hybrid, you'll hear them a lot. Ground ops, that's possible. Um, and then our nets. We have national nets, and they're each one of them, a uh, directed one is usually controlled by a person or persons, and they become the net control station for that particular time and, and place. You transmit only when you're called upon. Usually it's an intern issue, or if it's a general area, um, like uh, our Northwest sector, you could have Oregon, Idaho, Washington, Montana, say, all trying to log in at the same time. And that's fine because they've restricted a specific area rather than the entire continent of the United States. Directed nets generally follow published schedules. <clears throat> a free net means that members can tall, call other members on that network <clears throat> without going through the net control station. The net control station still has responsibility for monitoring so that they, some of those 10 negative things aren't done. So always remember someone is always listening. And then how to stay proficient, make every effort to, to join local exercises and uh, remember your zone and channel designators on our radios and frequencies. They're all for the frequencies are for official use only. And the channel number channel numbers can differ from wing to wing and fortunately, we're all in Washington for all the students here, so it really doesn't matter. And then practice, uh, practice receiving and accurately copying messages. That way, you become proficient, and it becomes much easier, and you become much faster. Um, remember, <clears throat> incident command system to remain in contact, to search aircraft and ground teams. That's what we. That's our purpose. And that's what we need to do and make sure that we are as accurate as possible. And I do believe that's it. And this is one of our pilots making a rather crude landing. Uh, are there any questions from anyone? I'll end sharing. No, not a question, so I just had a comment. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on the distress signal, somewhere I found where you can actually hear them in regular use, especially during the summer on the weekends, Marine Channel 16, which is the International Distress Channel for Boaters, the Coast Guard will receive and transmit numerous pon-pon messages and security messages on a typical weekend. Right, and, and a lot of those messages are done for um, um, uh, strong winds or high swells, or uh, there's a whole bunch of, you'll see a lot of that stuff along the uh, Oregon and Washington coast. 
and um, National Weather Service usually generates those advisories for the Coast Guard system to help the boaters out there. But thank you very much, sir. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> So Major Wicklin. Yes, sir. By completing the ICUT and having um, the ICUT certification, does that mean everybody in the class can go run out and uh, start talking on a cap radio right out of the gate? No. What it means is that you've got some background now that you're not completely <clears throat> out of touch. And then you get you get a hold of some really geriatric looking guy like me who sits down there next to you with a radio and we go back through all of this again until you get familiar with it. And then that's during an exercise or some sanctioned um, form of exercise that allows you to get credit as a mission radio operator. You need two of those types of exercises in order to be able to function on your own um, <clears throat> without adult supervision, well, without old people's supervision. Uh, Experienced. Yeah. And uh, uh, then you're, you're going to help out your squadron immensely because what it does is it gives a diversity to the, the radio folks that now you can expand, you can have another radio, you can have uh, the, one of those big radios talking conus wide and it allows them to do a separate series of communications while you're primarily supporting your search and rescue exercise or your ground team. So there is a, there's a very big benefit for that. And so just, just having this part of the virtual portion of the class is just more of a refresher of what you um, saw on the AXIS um, uh, training, um, online training. And this is just, it emphasizes vocally and through the PowerPoint um, what you go through. So I hope that answered your questions. <clears throat> it did, and it answered mine. So in essence, it's basically like a learner's permit for driving. You're now legal to talk on a cap radio, but you've got somebody there at your side. Right. And so if, the, yeah, if there's, if there's confusion or they didn't catch it, someone else is writing down what was being said as well so that you can compare notes later on before you log it in or you put it on the comm log. That's, it's sort of like a fail safe type thing. And then you guarantee that you're not confusing the operations folks in another room perhaps, <clears throat> that they're getting conflicting information. You're getting exactly what was said by either a ground team or an air crew. Oh, and just to put it into perspective for uh, a number of you, <clears throat> Major Wicklin went over, there's basically three types of radios. Um, the ISRs, the squad radios, which will be most commonly used uh, by cadets and at activities. Then there's the VHF, whether it's a base or a mobile, and then there's the HF. I dare say that there are huge numbers of CAP members who are ICUT certified that if, uh, because they're not exposed to it on a regular basis, you drop them in front of an HF radio. And since it hasn't been used will be, how do I do this mm -hmm. type of thing? So the point that I'm getting at is this opens the door for you to practice and embrace and use because for those of you that have been involved in some of the SARXs and some of the planning, there's more and more planning centered around um, what's called a com out in which the communications infrastructure is down. There is no internet, there is no cell towers, and you have to rely on boots on the ground with a piece of paper or your radios kind of thing. So just keep that in mind that there's an increasing emphasis that in Civil Air Patrol. So no, a question unasked is the only question I kind of consider to be <clears throat> not appropriate. What are your, what questions do you have for Major Wickland? What are your concerns about moving forward with your ICUT information and becoming a 
a communicator as opposed to just check off a box. <laughs> One question, can you uh, hear me? Yes. Yeah, one question I had is how do you individualize uh, call signs for individual members in the field? Um, and then the, the group call signs, like I'm slowly kind of understanding how you're doing it, but if you have multiple members in the field, are they assigned a individual call sign that day or does it shift? No, um, what, this is where SAR exercises will help you immensely. Um, what normally happens is your mission base, <clears throat> where your comm unit will be, where your ops guys will be, where your mission release folks will be, they'll be like Caldera 5-0. Now, the people in the field will have a single call sign. Normally, it's assigned to the van. If it's a uh, VHF radio like our little 5317, They'll use the vehicle's license plate number. Here in Washington, for example, it will be um, Caldera 6687. If you have an HF radio in that van, it's the same call sign, but now it's shortened to Caldera 89. So they know specifically where that van is because they're calling in every 30 minutes to notify you where they are, what road they're on, what they're doing, where they're at, have they found something, have they heard a beeper, or are they getting ready to set up a ground team to send out? So there's one call sign for each specific unit um, it, within that uh, exercise mode or within that structure, if that hopefully makes sense. Yeah, okay, so it's actually tied to the radio in whichever vehicle or unit that it's with. Exactly correct. The, the uh, option is that if you, um, have a radio at your residence or something like what myself and Colonel Wiggs and a couple others have all around the state. What they'll do is they'll have they'll have been assigned a specific call sign. Mine is called Era 40. Uh, Colonel Wiggs is 46. Um, uh, Colonel Sinclair is four. So those imply that they have a radio and it's sitting in front of them and then they're capable of being used them if if we have a catastrophic event and all the cell phone towers like colonel wiggs was saying drops offline that's that's the whole purpose of having radios out there uh, at individual locations and they're spread out throughout the wing so that there's not a you know a huge grouping of them all in one spot awesome thank you you're welcome. Any other questions? And, uh, sir, on the topic of call signs, aircraft are always going to be the uh, call sign assigned to the aircraft, i.e. 4698. Yeah, yeah. and normally when, when a person calls in, you know it's FAA knows that if, if you initiate a call with CAP, whether it's 4698, 46 is state of Washington, 98 is the last two digits of their tail number. And so for us, that's why I used our particular um, aircraft call sign or tail number for um, the start of this um, PowerPoint presentation. And so they'll always call it in as cap 4698, but a, but a van will always call in as a caldera, whatever so that there's a distinct difference because if you confuse cap and cap, you're saying, wait a minute, have I got two airplanes or have I got two vans with four wheels? So um, that's the distinction and FAA accepts the call sign of cap, whatever the numbers are. So um, anything else, anyone? Well, I thank you for putting up with me for an hour or so. Well, thank you, Major. I know you put a lot of effort into this, um, and I thank everybody for participating. I would urge everyone to try to practice the procedures. As I said, for those of you that are not experienced communicators, either in CAP or otherwise, um, a lot of this is new, but you can practice these concepts in the virtual world.
Any thoughts, comments, concerns coming back to us? Since we have a few moments, so we will end a little bit early, but Colonel Gorham, how would cadets that are on this call utilize this, especially more or less in the immediate future? How do you see cadets using these tools and what would be their most common tool that they use? It's a loaded question. Yes, sir. So um, with radios at your home squadron, uh, there's a couple opportunities if you're doing SAR exercises, things like that. Um, if your squadron can also participate in uh, the nets that they have throughout the wing once you get back in person, um, I know there's a lot of opportunities. So if you have senior members at your squadron, you can talk to them about seeing if you can have like a cadet position. If you're interested in working more with radios, you can talk about that. Um, as well on the cadet side, uh, we're working to get, uh, we have a radio room at WAMA um, and communicating with that. And so when we do actually go back to Camp Boucher, we're gonna have cadets involved with running that radio room. And so that's a really cool opportunity to be able to work with those communication skills as a mission radio operator. Um, and then also at our encampments as well, we use ISRs to communicate between the cadet staff. So that's a practical um, hands-on application of using radios for communication uh, on a mission as well. So as even as a cadet, there's a lot of opportunities you get to be able to use radios and practice these communications things. Very good. And one additional um, activity that's familiar to me and Colonel Maxwell would be Desert Eagle. There's multiple layers of communications going on with aircraft, ground, uh, and the facility, various and sundry of our other activities. Uh, what is it? Uh, is it Oshkosh? Um, Arlington fly-in. Arlington, that's what I was, I was grasping for. So I would encourage it as much as possible. If you have any questions and need additional practice or clarification, Major Wickland or myself will be happy to respond to anyone that has those types of concerns or questions. We can set up more virtual practices as well. Um, our goal here is to break the ice, help you check a box off, yes, but start you down the road where you're comfortable with working with our communications gear, moving down the road, so to speak. And the important thing is, is to get you cadets involved in search and rescue exercises, because if we have a catastrophic event, like could happen with a, a subsidence type of activity with the tectonic plates <clears throat> deciding to make huge tidal waves and destroy bridges around here on, especially in Washington, <clears throat> we know that we can't go hardly anywhere in the city of Vancouver without crossing a bridge or going under one. So it's important to find out, do you have alternate means of getting to your um, squadron headquarters, if that's where you have your radios located, to find out, is there a way to get there short of a bicycle or walking, which probably is plan B anyway, but um, <clears throat> can you get there without using a bridge or without anything um, that's just collapsed or whatever uh, that you makes it untenable to use a vehicle? So um, always keep that in mind when you're, when you're thinking out, are there ways of getting out of here? Are there ways of getting back to my mission base? Are there ways of uh, communicating with others? And by doing so, um, you make a much more cohesive team. And that's where you cadets can be extremely useful, especially through practicing and search and rescue exercises or local squadron exercises they might do on a weekend. We're planning to do one here uh, this next Saturday, um, just to make sure people understand how to do radio comms since we can't talk to each other or be together. So, uh, but that's it. That's my bit. Okay. Thank you, sir. Last call for the good of the order. <laughs> all right. I give you the gift of 14 minutes. Thank you one and all. Appreciate your participation. Look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you, sir. Hopefully at some point in person. Yeah. <laughs>
<clears throat> recording. Nice job. Nice job, Major Wicklin. <laughs>